Okay, so the second video is going to focus on a few other reformers, and the first one we're going to start with is a French man named John Calvin, uh, who's going to make some reforms, not necessarily in France, that'll come down the road, uh, but really in Switzerland, okay? So he is a Protestant reformer who is in Switzerland, and he takes a completely different route than Martin Luther is going to take when it comes to his versions of theology. And understand, as we get to the Protestant Reformation, every step of Protestant groups along the way uh, gets farther and farther away from the Catholic Church. You know, Lutherans are like diet Catholicism. It's a version of the Catholic Church, but not quite the same. As we move away with the Calvinists, and the Calvinists and, and will be called Huguenots in France, they'll be called Presbyterians in Scotland, but these Calvinists are going to step away even from Luther, and we get all the way out to Anabaptists, who are the far extreme version of the Protestant churches that are, that are out there. Okay, so here's a Protestant reformer in Switzerland, and what he's going to preach and promote is what is called predestination. This is the idea that God has already chosen uh, essentially who is going to heaven. Uh, they are predestined to go to heaven. So in that case, of course, if you follow Calvin and follow Calvinism, then you are predestined. You have been chosen by God to go into heaven. The same thing is going to be felt uh, with the ideas of the Huguenots in France, and it's also going to be the idea of the Presbyterians in Scotland as well. Okay. Now what Calvin's going to do a little differently is he's going to make this a government idea. So he sets up a theocracy in Geneva, which is the capital city of Switzerland. And he's going to run it through Calvinism. Of course, Switzerland is also a heavy Catholic country, so there's going to be a lot of conflict. And people in Geneva are not very fond of Calvin and what he's trying to do, so they actually kick him out of Geneva. But when he returns, his, his government through war, of course, through conflict, is going to be set up and he's going to run Switzerland. And Geneva is really going to be the headquarters of the Calvinist church and kind of as they move forward, uh, where Calvinism really takes hold and becomes very, very important. Okay. So, like mentioned, Calvinism does spread, but it's definitely going to be with conflict. Uh, the Huguenots are going to run into major, major issues in France. As a matter of fact, uh, there will be a terrible massacre of Huguenots by Catholics on St. Bartholomew's Day that kind of goes in line with what's been going on in France uh, in a time period known as the War of Three Henrys, uh, where Henry IV is actually going to come to the, th the throne, and we'll look at him more when we focus on the absolute monarchs, will come to the throne as a Huguenot, which will lead to even more violent conflict until he decides to convert himself away from Huguenot, being a Huguenot, to Catholicism to quell the tensions, and then he'll give up what is called the Edict of not to uh, allow Huguenots to practice. Um, that's going to cause some conflict down the road, especially when we get to Louis XIV. But this idea of Calvinism and Protestantism versus Catholicism is going to be very bloody and very dangerous as we move forward. Okay, And then obviously up in Scotland, um, John Knox, who is a uh, a person who's followed John Calvin is going to establish a Presbyterian church in Scotland that's going to come over to the United States eventually um, and has a lot of his same ideas where it's a council of elders that are really in control and it's a local council and that's a big part of Calvinism and that it's locally religious as opposed to the Pope out in Rome or some high-ranking person in control. It's a much more local type religion. All right, so there's an explosion of Protestantism, Protestant sects. You have hundreds of Protestant groups begin to break away, each one finding a little difference within each other and separating away, okay? One of them being the Anabaptists, and the really big part of the Anabaptists is they reject infant baptism, hence the Anna against Baptist part. Now, they do baptize, but it's meant to be as an adult. So modern-day Baptist churches really look at the Anabaptists as their original kind of like founding fathers of their faith, and... You know, the big part here is where baptism happens. The Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church, as in a few other Protestant churches, look at baptism as an infant for the Anabaptists and other Baptist churches that are going to come along. It's looking at uh, baptism from an adult point of view, one of you has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, as opposed to being told that Jesus Christ is their Savior. And that's going to be a big fundamental difference when it comes to religion. The Anabaptists really are on the far end um, of the Protestant Reformation, as opposed to Lutherans who are much, much closer to Catholicism. So what I want you to do right now is just pause the video for a few seconds, write down as many Protestant groups as you can, different Protestant churches you can figure out, and we'll try to list them on the board in class. 
Okay, so the other big reformation that's going to go on is the English Reformation. And of course it's going to center around Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII and the English, and the English people in the, in the Catholic Church were very tied to one another. As a matter of fact, Henry VIII was very closely associated with the Pope um, leading up to this issue where he finally decides to break away from the Pope. And as a matter of fact, the Pope, when Martin Luther is beginning to kind of gain some steam, um, Henry VIII writes uh, basically writes a journal saying how Martin Luther's wrong, that this is like devilish, this is in line with the Catholic Church. And he is actually given the title of Defender of the Faith for the Catholic Church as the King of England. But there's going to be a problem, okay? So, what Henry VIII is, what he wants is an annulment from his wife, uh, Catherine of Aragon. Uh, and the real big reason is his wife did not produce him a son that he wanted. What Henry was noticing is he had no heir to the throne, and he wanted an heir to the throne. And to do that, uh, England had never had a queen before. He, they had always had kings, and they were fearful that when he had a child, which he did have with Catherine of Aragon, he's going to have uh, Mary, which will become Mary, uh, Bloody Mary, as you familiar know, familiar know her, um, but Mary Tudor, they were really fearful that if they have a queen, that England would appear as weak and be taken over by other countries. So he wanted to make sure he had a king um, as a son. So he asked for an annulment. Plus, he makes the argument that Catherine was actually his brother's uh, wife that he married because when he died, that was the right thing to do to take her on. And because that he feels, since that wasn't really justified, that you shouldn't have married your brother's wife, that this marriage actually never happened. Um, but that obviously wasn't the case. So he wants an annulment. In the, in the Catholic Church, an annulment is a break away from marriage. It's not a divorce. It's basically saying that the marriage never happened. Of course, uh, the Pope is not going to give it to him. All right, so there is Catherine of Aragon, who is the daughter of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. So, again, political ties between the, the uh, leadership, the Tudor dynasty in England, and the um, Castile and Aragon dynasty in uh, Spain. Okay, so there's a lot of ties there, of course, politically. And her daughter is going to be Mary Tudor. Mary's going to be raised a Catholic um, because she is sent away back to Spain to learn. Okay, and that's going to be in contrast to her father as he moves away from Catholicism into the English Reformation, what will be the Anglican Church. Okay, so the Pope does not grant the annulment because he's got issues with Charles V. And remember back in the last video, Charles V is the Holy Roman Emperor who is also the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, and they're very close to one another as a family, and he doesn't want to upset Charles V because Charles V is about to invade the Vatican, and if he does any worse, he's going to destroy um, the, the Pope, essentially, down in Rome. So to do that, he does not actually grant the annulment. Um, and when he doesn't do that, he very much upsets Henry, and Henry's going to start to make some major rash decisions, uh, ultimately that he wants a divorce away from his wife. Okay, so what he does, he turns to one of his archbishops, Thomas Cramner, who was really willing to grant the divorce and basically saying that the church should be in the hands of the monarch, not necessarily of the pope. And he grants the divorce uh, as a Catholic bishop, archbishop without the knowledge of the pope, and he allows... Uh, Henry VIII to marry his mistress at the time, a woman by the name of Anne Boleyn. And of course, Anne Boleyn promises him a son. Okay, so there is Anne Boleyn. Of course, how can you promise a particular gender of a child? That's not within our normal minds. He can't do that. And of course, what does he have? A second child? He has a girl. And this will be Elizabeth I. And she will eventually become the first queen of England as Queen Elizabeth and start off the Elizabethan age, which we'll talk about when we get to the uh, monarchs. Now, Anne Boleyn is not going to go without any issues as the wife of Henry VIII. He actually accuses her of cheating on him, uh, of being an adulterer, accused of, of plotting to kill him, and that will be the first wife he has his head, her head removed. Okay, So Anne Boleyn is executed. Of course, he's got another woman that he's ready to marry. Her name is Jane Seymour. And of course, Jane Seymour does give him a son. It's going to be Edward, and Edward will be the king of England eventually. But the problem with Jane Seymour, who Henry VIII very much loved, is she's going to die because of childbirth. Now, with
with this separation and this divorce, okay, it upsets the Pope very much. And what Henry decides, of course, with the use of Parliament, is he's going to go ahead and start his own church called the Church of England. Um, in this case, the Pope is no longer the head of the church, but the King of England, or eventually the Queen of England, is the head of the church. Okay, and it makes the English Reformation actually happen. And Henry VIII goes from defender of the Catholic faith to the anti-Catholic um, when it comes to the English Reformation. Of course, when I say anti-Catholic, it's not the Catholic Church anymore, but the Anglican Church, the Church of England, will look very much like the Catholic Church to does today. Okay, So he's going to go after monasteries uh, and break down their wealth, but he's going to keep a lot of the teachings of the Catholic Church. Of course, very famously, Henry goes on to marry another woman. Her name is Anne of Cleves. Uh, he calls her his Flanders mare. Basically, he's calling her a horse face because she's not very pretty. Um, and in doing so, they annul the marriage. Uh, she will stay in his court. She is the only non-royal, uh, English royal buried at Westminster Abbey. He loves her like a sister, but he could not marry her anymore. He goes on to his fifth wife, which would be Catherine, ha Catherine Parr? Catherine Howard. They're both named Catherine. I, anyway, uh, and he uh, it's Catherine Howard. He has her executed for actually she was trying to plot to kill him um, and was cheating on him, ironically enough, with her cousin. So he has her head removed, uh, and then he finally marries Catherine Parr, who is with him at the end. Of course, she is cheating on him as well, but it doesn't really make a difference because Henry VIII is going to die anyway. Um, when she has her next child, she's going to remarry to a Stuart, and that's going to end the Tudor dynasty, begin the Stuart dynasty, and the next line of monarchy is going to move on in the English um, English culture, English civilization. All right, so we're kind of wrapping up here with the English Reformation. When Henry dies, okay, his son Edward becomes king. Of course, Edward's going to die a very unexpected death in his teens, which is going to lead to a next issue. The thing that Henry really worried about the most was a queen being in control. Okay, and Mary Tudor is going to come in, his firstborn daughter. She becomes queen. She's married to Philip II of Spain, who is a Catholic, and begins to persecute uh, Protestants. She's going to burn over 300 at the stake, hence the nickname Bloody Mary. Of course, when she dies, her sister Elizabeth becomes the queen. And what she's going to do is much, much different. She's going to re, uh, reinvigorate the Church of England and bring Protestantism in, in the Anglican Church back to where it needs to be. But she's also going to start to compromise between Protestants and Catholics to avoid this kind of conflict. Um, and in saying that, England becomes one of the most religiously tolerant countries in the world at the time. That's going to change very dramatically as we move forward. But, you know, Queen Elizabeth is really going to push for this new type of Elizabethan age, and that's where you're going to see Shakespeare and a lot of Northern Renaissance in England pop out and become very, very influential of the day. All right, the third video will wrap us up. We'll talk about the Catholic uh, Council of Trent and the Catholic Reformation, and we'll also talk about the Thirty Years' War and the end of the Reformation.